my name is Tuv, and today we're going to be talking about photos that were taken before disasters. Garrett Miller's last photo. I'm angry. I feel like Garrett was let down. I feel like we've been let down. We feel like something near and dear and precious to us has been ripped out of our hearts. Those were the words of a distraught Dave Mills speaking to the press after losing his son, 15-year-old Garrett Mills, to a rather pointless accident. Garrett Mills died on what? May 12th, 27th. Bro, look like the nerd. Bro, look like the uh, school tech guy. That like every like every school had, but like he was a student. Like he'd be the guy who like who would like plug in the HDMI cord for all the teachers who didn't know how to do it with the uh, the projectors and shit. Just a nerd. 17 at King Street Park in Nepani, Ontario, Canada, shortly after leaving school while hanging out with both his girlfriend and best friend. Just about 10 minutes before his death, these photos had been taken, and they quite accurately captured the mood that he was in. In the first photo, you can make out, though faintly, that behind his ear, he had tucked in a flower, a dandelion to be more specific, then the second photo has him flexing his muscles for the camera. In both photos, he's smiling. This is actually confirmed by what was reported over and hit him on the head. As his dad put it, it that evening. So, what happened to Garrett 10 minutes after had been hanging out at King Street Park to kill time ahead of Garrett's first ever official date with his girlfriend, which would have been at the movies later that evening. So, what happened to Garrett 10 minutes after these photos were taken? Well, a goal post fell on him, killing him instantly. Are Apparently, you serious? He had been what? Off a little bit for his girlfriend and started doing chin ups on the soccer crossbar. Unfortunately, the whole thing tipped over and hit him on the head. As his dad put it, it just simply tipped over on him and the crossbar struck him on the left side of his head, killing him instantly. He also oh, added that no. in the coroner's report, his death was instantaneous. Some other specific details that emerged included the fact that the goalpost was a bit of an older model, which meant most of the weight was at the top. We're talking 180 to 200 pounds. Also, it wasn't anchored Bro. down. The father phrased it as, quote, needless and not needing to have happened. He also went on to say that based on his knowledge of the park, he had no idea it carried such a risk. His exact words mean that he never thought, quote, this harmless park had the potential to take somebody's life. End quote. And that goalpost was immediately replaced That's with actually this one, sad. which is anchored down. That, however, didn't stop Garrett's dad from committing to getting justice. While saying he wasn't out to get blood, he explained that he for sure knew someone dropped the ball and he was going to find out who. Quote unquote, whether it was budget. Uh, he, he want money, bro. That's what it is. Whether it was just neglect or forgetfulness. How does everybody, how does everyone pull? It's not hard to pull, bro. You just got to be like, just you got to talk to women to pull women, bro. You gotta talk to women to pull. ...of action, given that in the past, other parents have done so and succeeded in not only getting justice, but helping prevent this to happening to other people. I'm specifically referring to a case in 2003 where a 184-pound goalpost, in the same manner as this one, made to be in point that... Okay, well, uh, let's get to the next one. ...flight 17. In July of 2014, a Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777 plane, specifically flight 17, in an evidently very tragic event, got shot down by a Russian-made surface-to-air missile while on its scheduled path. Whoa. Whoa. A half hour flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The accident caused quite a stir as it bordered on being from Amsterdam by a Russian made surface to air missile while on its scheduled path. An 11 and a half bordered on any responsibility. It was a politically motivated attack with Russia being accused but refusing any responsibility. As recently as last year, the investigations were still ongoing with allegations of possible involvement by Putin. Now, there's a whole lot to say about that situation, but let's just focus on this photo here. This photo was actually taken shortly after after boarding by a father and as you might guess it's of his wife and daughter apparently damn Dave that's Holly, eerie the father and his wife kim holly were on that flight headed to their dream holiday in malaysia together with their four-year-old daughter megan unknown to dave this would be the last photo he'd ever take and it would be a photo that their families would use to comfort themselves telling themselves that well at least they were all together and happy monique the sister talking to cnn said we were looking at them that's crazy bro i'm not gonna lie we're gonna skip through this video i just want to know the basic information about about everything, and then your family was just gonna get through it. Putin might have approved the missile launch, thus believing that more prosecutions could be made. The evidence was, however, not enough, leading to the end of the investigation in February of 2023. I ain't gonna lie, Russia definitely knew what it was. They was just trying to make a statement. Because, like, how do you mistake, like, a bro like a, a passenger plane for whatever like just come on bro as their prime minister mark Rube, you can't really do anything to about to that as russia Federation to account for its role in this tragedy 
Pat Tillman's last photo. Next up is the incredibly sad case of Pat Tillman, whose death at the prime age of 27 would go on to oh, a rather complex web of alleged lies, cover-ups, and borderline sabotage actions by the U.S. government. Bro, and the story of Pat Tillman. The, US media. the story of Pat Tillman, Tillman is crazy, bro. We'll begin with the photo. This here is Pat. That photo was taken sometime before April 22nd, 2004, in southeastern Afghanistan's coast. Yeah, I got a peep gay for this. A member of the 75th Ranger Regiment was patrolling alongside his unit. That turned out to be the last photo. Appreciate you, YK, for the 245 bits. Would get killed. Three bullets to the head at close range. Now, one thing you should know about Pat is. Yo, Cloud, you played a song. Yo, could you play the song Person I Came From by Fresco Trey before you end the stream? I guess you think you'll. I guess you think you'll get copyright stricken. Then it's cool. I'll try to play it. That he used to be an NFL player before enlisting in around 2002. The enlisting was also right after the 9-11 attacks and his motive, clearly, was to stand up for his country in the face of terror. He'd enlisted to join the fight against Al-Qaeda and the effort to bring Osama bin Laden to justice. As this article from The Intercept explains, the fact that he left behind a $3.6 million NFL contract with the Arizona Cardinals made his story jump right into the headlines as the Bush administration used it for pro-war publicity. He became the living, breathing symbol of honor, sacrifice, and more. So knowing all of this, you can see why his death in 2004 was a big deal. The army, for instance, reporting that he'd been killed as he, quote, charged up a ridge line, braving enemy fire and defending his fellow soldiers, publicized the death flying helicopters over a stadium in his honor, broadcasting his memorial That's on crazy, TV, bro. awarding him a silver star and the purple heart, and promoting him posthumously to corporal. A rather drastic twist, however, and this is where the lies began unraveling, came in when news spread that Pat wasn't killed by enemy fire, but rather by his own side. And while mostly termed accidental, this became a contested view since the facts never added up. Army doctors, for instance, said the shots were, quote, suspicious due to the close proximity of the wounds. As news caught on, the army had to issue an announcement a month later, clarifying that indeed Pat had been killed by fellow soldiers. There were no enemies nearby, and they did so rather brutally because apparently as they took aim at him, he yelled, I'm Pat f***ing Tillman, trying to get them to stop. Those were the last words he'd ever speak. Even sadder, though, is Whoa. the fact that it took years seven official investigations, and two congressional hearings for Pat's family to get some shreds of truth of what actually happened. Despite the army admitting that Pat had died of friendly fire, they hadn't offered much explanation. As Pat's mother, Mary Tillman, put it, they had no regard for him as a person, and they attached themselves to his virtue and then threw him under the bus. His brother, Kevin Tillman, who was serving under the same unit as him, also told Congress that as the evidence raised questions on the army's version of events, an alternative narrative had been constructed. In short, they lied because they didn't want to be public embarrassed. Now, this is a pretty elaborate case, and there's a lot of stuff that I've left out, but the following words by Kevin Tillman sort of encapsulate the whole thing. Speaking to Congress in 2007, he said, The deception surrounding this case was an insult to the family, but more importantly, its primary purpose was to deceive a whole nation. Knowing all that, his last photo suddenly carries way more depth. Yeah, it, it was some crazy shit. I don't even lie. Senna's last photo. One of the most respected names in F1. From the Apparently, he knew some shit. Now is Air they blicked him off. This is his last photo, taken moments before he got into a fatal crash. I'll come back to the crash, but first, why? Why is he one of the most respected names in F1? Okay, bro, I'm, 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 I don't anyway, need to know this shit. I don't need to know this shit. No, there ain't no grand. Senna fatally crashed into a concrete barrier, with the incident being partially blamed on speed. This happened during the seventh lap when, during a corner named the Tamburello, his car left the racing line, ran in a straight path away from the track, and hit an unprotected concrete barrier. Data recovered Yo. from the wreckage revealed that Senna had been doing a staggering 192 miles per hour, that's 309 kilometers per hour for my non-US viewers, just before the corner. He had then braked hard, shifting down twice to get slower right before hitting the wall at at 131 miles per hour. That's 211 kilometers per hour. The impact tore off the right front wheel and the nose cone as the car spun to a halt. Unfortunately, that wheel tore off and had bounced on the cockpit, hitting the front of his helmet, Damn. Finally, shoving him against the headrest, which had already been bent forward by the wall's impact. Senna not only suffered fractures to his skull, but also had head trauma as part of the suspension and upright assembly had penetrated his helmet. And although the medical professionals got to him while he was still alive, the head of the on-track medical team said, why? and said, we lifted him from the cockpit and laid him on the ground. As we did, he sighed and, although I'm not religious, I felt his spirit depart at that moment. Later, investigations were done and an Italian court blamed the accident on a, quote, hastily adapted steering column. This undeniably tragic event did lead to some positive changes, as it saw a revision of F1 rules about speed, runoff areas, track layouts, crash tests, and more, all to promote driver safety. Now, just like in all the previous cases, knowing all that, looking at Senna's last photo creates a much deeper empathy damn 
She crazy, bro. Photo before tsunami. This next story might just have you questioning just how often things can happen out of random chance. So the story is about John and Jackie Nell, a couple from Vancouver, Canada, who died when a tsunami hit a beach where they were vacationing in in Thailand. This happened back in December of 2004, right after Christmas. On the yo, imagine like you're on vacation and then a fucking big ass tsunami just wipes your fucking beach house out and you just die, like in Japan or whatever. That's crazy. Like, that's the worst luck you could have, bro. Of all weeks, photo the photo week photo you photo go photo to that place, away. Now, we'll nigga, the whole shit just goes crazy. We'll come back to that couple, but first, let's talk about the story of Christian Pele. So, Pele and his wife, Nicole, both missionaries from Washington State, heard the news of the devastating tsunami that hit Thailand and traveled alongside some of their colleagues to go offer some help. They booked a hotel room and got right to it. And this was a month after the tsunami, about January 26th. The interesting part of Pele's story is that while walking down the beach at Khao Lak, his friend Cameron kicked something with his foot, saying, Look, it's a smashed digital camera. And for the last conversation, Cation, after watching these pictures, seeing people capture the last moments of the beach before the tsunami into his Palm Pilot, what he saw were photos that captured the last moments of the beach before the tsunami hit. He said, We were watching these pictures, seeing people live their lives, enjoying themselves, having a wonderful vacation, and then it was as if we had picked up a tape recorder and heard somebody's last conversation, and then it just ended suddenly. Unknown to him, it was John and Jackie Nill's final moments captured on camera. So, Whoa. how did the camera end up at the beach? Well, going back to the couple, it turns out that they had visited Thailand several times before, enough to consider it their second home. On that specific vacation, when the tsunami hit, they had been there a while, enjoying themselves as usual, and everything had been fine. They even called their children on December 25th to wish them a Merry Christmas, and the next day, the 26th, they woke up early to go to the beach to capture the beautiful moments and brought along their digital camera. While at the beach, they spotted a large wave from a distance and, unaware of the impending danger, began taking photos of it. I believe these were the photos that Pelé described as hearing someone's last conversation. Here are some of those photos. You can easily make out that the wave can be seen in the far horizon in the first That's photo. That's a big ass wave. With each photo to a very close of range in the last one. They That's must have been swept off wave. right after. Now the couple's children, Patrick, David, and Christian, after seeing the news of the disaster and failing to get in contact with their parents, had John Nil's brother-in-law travel to Thailand in search for their bodies. He succeeded as on December 31st, 2004, John's body was found, and later on January 13th, 2005, Jackie's body was also found. It's not clear what happened wow. after, but undoubtedly, no one would have known the couple's last moments had Pelé not only randomly found the camera, but also made an effort to reach out to the family and share the photos with them. Patrick, one of the he was Darsh Patel's last photo. On Sunday, September 21st, 2014, Darsh Patel, a Rutgers University student and four of his university friends, decided to go hiking at the Upshawa Preserve in West Milford, New Jersey. Carrying granola bars and water, this would have been a perfectly normal hike if it wasn't for one bear that was stalking them. Yes, a black bear stalked the group, killing one of them, that being Darsh Patel, and mauled him to death. Darsh Damn. was only 22 years old. Interestingly, or rather bizarrely, the attack, which authorities called high unusual happened just before Patel took this photo of Whoa. a 300 pound black bear from about 100 feet or 30 meters away. Actually, he took a total of five photos with the bear seeming to get closer with each shot. It was Why wouldn't you run, bitch? Like, bro, you gotta be smarter, what? After the pictures were taken- The bear just keeps on creeping up on you, bro, lurking, and you just, you feel me? Oh, it's a bear. Let me take a picture. Nah, they can run. After them, with the chase being that white people had shit, bro. Gotten too close, just 15 feet away. Maybe they ran in different directions, with the bear just coincidentally aiming for Patel. The police statement issued by. If y'all don't get on topic in chat, bro. Police actually confirms this, as in full it reads. What are y'all doing? Five hikers encountered a black bear in the woods that began to follow them. They became frightened and attempted to flee the area. During the confusion, the group became separated as they ran in different locations. When they later regrouped, they discovered Patel was missing and immediately called the police. Hashtag bring my dead lucky charm. It wasn't until two hours later that Patel's body was found. He had sustained several bites and claw marks, even his phone, which came with Patel's titles. That's crazy. That bite, low run, low than done. I ain't gonna lie. Tough be yapping, bro. Bud Dwyer's last photo. Next up is this photo of Bud Dwyer, a man who, in an incredibly disturbing twist, took his own life on television. On January 22, 1987, burdened by a case of corruption and bribery, Dwyer shot himself on live TV. In the photo that I have just shown you, this one was taken moments before he did that. Now, Dwyer, born and bred in Missouri, had actually been a rather accomplished politician. What did he go through? Audience. Shooting yourself on live television is crazy. What demons was he facing? I don't know why they made it. They, they've been trying to make him wear the dress, bro. 
I ain't gonna lie, I was probably a producer. Try, try, hey, try to see what his butt looked like, bro. I ain't gonna lie. ...were leveled against him. He had risen from the position of the 6th District Representative in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 1964 to holding the office of Pennsylvania Treasurer in 1984. His journey saw him get re-elected for some of the positions and, of course, his name grew bigger with each election cycle, all thanks to his tenacious spirit and sheer commitment to public service. This, however, took a drastic turn for him in 1984 when it was revealed that public employees in Pennsylvania from 1979 to 1980 okay, a profit work. Bro. It was fishy, though, that such a big contract went to a firm with three full because about two months later on July 11th he learned the FBI was looking into CTA for having bribed other public drag but it's bad for example the same statement also read that Mrs. Kinclade had been asked by CTA her employer the boss had a secret Swiss bank account holding four and the court eventually charged him with this won't go away he would then go on to try to frustrate the investigations okay the bro you, you yapping bro I don't care Toronto. about the case huh? why did he die on January 22nd 1987 and Evan Magnet and his mouth and pulled the limbs red faced and sweating mr dwyer drew a 357 mac pennsylvania state cap faced 55 years in prison feeling an interstate transportation in aid of racketeering he faced 55 years in prison god damn he called for a press conference at the pennsylvania state capitol building in harrisburg on january 22nd 1987 and as reported by the new york times red faced and sweating mr dwyer drew a 357 magnum revolver from a manila envelope and before anyone got to him he put the barrel of the pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. No, nah, why would you do that on camera though? Imagine all the people he traumatized by doing that shit. You really a bitch for real, bro. If you finna do that shit, do that shit in the private of your home or whatever. Maybe your office. Nigga, doing that shit like, bro, in front of everybody, bro, like you're just a bitch, bro. You just want attention died about 30 minutes later. It was later discovered that knowing he would off himself, he asked for a letter to be delivered to Robert P. Casey, the then Pennsylvania governor. The letter detailed his dissatisfaction with the justice system, saying it did not, quote, function properly, and also requested that his wife, Joanne Dwyer, be appointed the interim treasurer. A pretty chilling case. I know it's very popular to talk about the actual video, since, yes, there is a video of him doing that action, but I just thought it was, uh, it's really talked about, and I, I didn't even know there was a final image of him, so I uh, just wanted to bring that to light Vicky Weaver's last Shit, photo. What's that video? Photo on our list is this one here of Vicky Weaver, whose death was probably avoidable had the FBI followed tactical procedures as set in the Constitution. House. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. This image is eerie as fuck. Oh my god, this is scary. It just feels weird. So, well, Vicky died from a gunshot in August of 1992 at her family's cabin in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. This happened when an FBI sniper, Lon Hiriuchi, during a standoff with Vicky's husband, Randy Weaver, fired a shot aimed at Kevin Harris, Randy's friend, only for it to end up hitting and killing Vicky. As argued in court by Jerry Spence, the Weaver's attorney, the sniper didn't need to fire the shots because, first, firing at an armed adult without warning them to surrender is unconstitutional. Second, the shots were fired while Randy and Kevin, the primary target, were in retreat and third the sniper placed Vicky and her children at risk by firing at the cabin's door not knowing who was behind it as a matter of fact the court upheld these charges leading to the US government incurring hefty fines Randy and his three daughters were awarded 3.1 million dollars bro just wanted to catch a body yeah he was just itching on the trigger bro Vicky, just an insert here he was getting war flashbacks he just wanted to shoot actually been shot after allegedly firing at the FBI agents who had killed the family's dog that had charged at the hearing in February 1991 and also March of that same year so the entire incident all the way to idaho is crazy to not showing up to court and that escalated to a disturbing shootout that led to multiple deaths i also don't think it helped that randy had been a self-proclaimed white separatist and religious fundamentalist who didn't trust the government at all in fact the entire reason he was living in a cabin with no electricity or running water was to seclude himself from the corrupt civilization the religious Bruh. beliefs also made him believe that the world was coming to an end it also seems that the standoff would have kept going if it weren't for civilian negotiator bo grits who convinced Randy to let Vicky's body be taken out of the cabin and for the critically injured Kevin to get medical help and second to surrender himself to law enforcement. Before I end this off, I do want to say rest in peace to all the people that I have spoken about in this video. Yeah, RP to everybody. That's crazy. That last one was crazy, bro. If you just took the fall, your girl would have had to go through that, bro. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta do better as a man. But hey, besides that.